I think we're, we're ready. Good. We're up and running. Yes. Zach, so. it's time to put that coffee down. Yeah, put it down. <laughs> <laughs> I got friends only want to talk business. Oh, my goodness. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying to put that coffee down and it's time for some Freightonomics. No. <laughs> what did I say? What did I say? I don't know. I beeped you unwittingly because we don't have our music. That's all right. <laughs> it's okay. You still have us, though. Yeah, you have us. Welcome to Freightonomics, everybody. Hello. We're here. Hello. So... Freightonomics, the show where we give you insight into the macroeconomic, but we also relate it into the freight world, transportation, etc. We try to make it as relatable as humanly possible, uh, presenting it in a way that is... As <laughs> What's not relatable about freight or economics? I don't know. Macroeconomic freight statistics. <laughs> you know, Sounds very approachable to it's me. It's super approachable. Uh, so, welcome to the show uh, today. And, you know, Anthony, we've... Uh, we've got a pretty big show today. Yeah, we do. We're um, going over quite a bit. We have I some... hope we can get it all. I hope. I think <laughs> so. Do we have anything coming up after? We'll just uh, take over an hour, you know? No, maybe we just run over. Maybe. Um, it's a marathon. Yeah. Freightonomics marathon. <laughs> that's what That's what we'll do. We'll give the people what they want. <laughs> they're, at, they're clamoring for more Freightonomics. Yeah. Um, we're live, though, so... I am currently monitoring, of course, as always, the live stream on LinkedIn and YouTube and all that good stuff. So if you have any questions, anything like that, feel free to type those in. And Zach, yeah, we're we're probably going to start with some of the top news items, right? Yeah, so I think everybody is obviously, you know, they heard about coronavirus. Right. <laughs> uh, right. And everything that goes along with that. And, you know, so we've got 80,000 cases. Yeah. 2,000 deaths reported. Again, there could be people out there that have this that don't know it. Uh, you know, they could have, you know, it, it, it looks like the flu, acts like the flu, turns into pneumonia, just like mm. the flu does at times. Uh, not going to get into the whole virology of all that. But at the same time, uh, you know, having talked to enough people, I think, you know, the sense of this thing, you know, everybody wants, the, the press kind of blows it up. Yeah. I don't want to be part of that. <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah, even though we are sort of the press at we're, this we're point. We're pseudo-media, right? We're sort media. of. Sort of. Um, uh, it, is, it is an important story to cover, but it's not necessarily, it does not mean that you are going to have to run out, buy a bunch of bread and milk and po- piles of water and canned food and, and the apocalypse is coming. Uh, this is essentially like an entire country taking a sick day at the same time. Yeah, I mean, the apocalypse <laughs> could be coming, but this is not the calling card. No. All right. No zombie apocalypse. <laughs> All right. Don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, if you heard those numbers that I just told you, 80,000 yeah. confirmed illnesses, 2,000 deaths, about on par with the mortality rate of the flu. Yeah. Uh, the, the scary part about this is the fact that it is super contagious. Uh, the, an entire country that controls a lot of the United States production, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that we move through the country, anything you buy on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, some of these bigger companies uh, that do control a lot of the shipping lanes in the United States uh, have, an, you know, some at least amount of their business that comes across the, uh, the ocean from China. Right. And a lot of those container ships are not getting loaded uh, because people are being told to stay home. Mm-hmm. You know, they're trying to contain this uh, outbreak as much as possible. They're not even calling it, I don't even think they've brought it into an epidemic phase yet. No, I haven't which, heard the word yet. Again, epidemic means it's kind of a regional outbreak, mm-hmm. that it's kind of spread throughout. I mean, if you think about the sheer population of China, yeah, billions, I think, what are they at, seven or eight billion people? They're up there. Yeah, uh, and 80,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not, even, it's not even close to a tenth of a percent mm-hmm. of the population that has this, uh, confirmed at least. Obviously, there's probably more than that out yeah, there. And again, yeah. we're talking about China, who isn't exactly known for its transparency. And it's not. Eh. <laughs> um, yeah, I would multiply that within China, of course. But, yes. but what we're seeing is, like you said, it's, it's, but it we is haven't impacting. heard the word pandemic no. either. Um, so one of the things is like, it's very sensationalized. We're hearing it. We're seeing it all over every single major news network for the most part. And um, I think for a big part, for, for a good reason, you should be prepared for it because we don't want it to get to the epidemic area. We don't want to. So my, my, we were chatting about this yesterday. My biggest concern is those countries that are third world or developing nations, I should say, 
that aren't quite prepped to deal with any kind of outbreak or sicknesses. Um, I, you know, U.S. and other developed nations um, have a amount of resources that we're they also, can do. We're also healthy. We're not yeah. malnourished yeah. Uh, compared to most other countries. Um, we're, we're our immune systems. We have vaccines. We have modern technology, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, we are more well-equipped. But China does control quite a bit of our freight economy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe uh, over a third of it, if our numbers are accurate, uh, maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, overall. We do use their labor force for quite a bit of our uh, productivity. Our manufacturing numbers, not great, are they, Anthony? They're, they're, they're not good. <laughs> no. We don't make a lot of stuff because we don't, we simply aren't equipped to get paid less to we, do those jobs. So with the U.S. manufacturing, mm -hmm. a lot of it is, is hit that, you know, that labor versus uh, technology yeah. shift. So it's like we produce quite a bit, but we're so much more efficient at it because we're using more machines and less labor but there, because I, of that trade-off. But I also think that like countries like Malaysia and China, well, not necessarily China, but Malaysia, uh, more, I guess, those you know advanced Southern Asia countries, if you will, there's mm -hmm. a ton of automation in those countries. Mm -hmm. uh, they have it down. I mean, you look at the port of Shanghai, it's actually extremely automated. Mm -hmm. It's more automated than we are in you know the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, yeah. which is supposedly the pinnacle. You know? Yeah. But again, not a lot of investment there, uh, and it was owned by a Chinese conglomerate for a while. Yeah. But they finally, Trump said, no, you can't own our biggest port in the country yeah. for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, we're not exactly great friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> again, it is, you know, it is a thing to monitor. How big the impact is going to be, I think, is the biggest question. You know, I was talking to uh, Mike Vincent this morning. He was very concerned about it. Shout out to Mike Vincent. Mike Vincent, you know, my boy. Yeah. Uh, we were arguing about it this morning, but he even got me a little bit kind of like, wait a minute, maybe I should be a little bit more That's concerned. what they do. That's, That's what they do. And I was like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> what are you doing? Listen to the numbers. They're yeah. not, it's not, it's not, that. and he's like, all the ports, everything shut down. I'm like, no, no, they're not. Um yeah. You know, right now, uh, Maersk reported about 50 to 60 percent uh, factory uh, online. Mm -hmm. The pro productivity there is still ramping up. It's not unusual this time of year to see this factory kind of lag, this productivity lag after the Chinese New Year. Obviously, it is slower yeah. than it normally would be. I believe the numbers they uh, anticipated were roughly around 70, 80 uh, percent productivity at this capacity at this point. Yeah. Um, they do still expect to be around 90 percent capacity by March. Um, so some of the theories out there right now, uh, this V-shaped recovery theory. Yeah. I like this one because it's pretty optimistic and it actually creates volatility and being a person that doesn't have to deal with the day-to-day -day transactional freight market anymore. Got uh, that volatility. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess, I guess as much as I, I don't want to be a part of like that whole media sensationalized thing, yeah. I do enjoy a good story Yeah. Uh, now that I don't have to actually do it anymore Right. Uh, in that in that regard, at least today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe Never someday know. I jump back in. Yeah. Um, but the V-shape recovery theory is effectively saying, all right, February import volumes mm -hmm. just totally bottom out. Yeah. Worst February on record, et cetera. Like it is just a desert of freight coming across the ocean, east, west coast, et cetera. Right. We're seeing that reflected in our, uh, you know, our rates coming from uh, China to North America. They haven't bottomed out though. Yeah. You know, they dropped from about, I, I believe it was like $1,485 to about $1,200 for the spot rate of an average 40 foot container over the last two weeks. Yeah. Again, they're not giving it away for free. Yeah. But they are also blank sailing or void sailing a lot of shipments coming across the ocean. Right. Because they're trying to manage that capacity. They can do that. It's mm -hmm. not like the trucking market mm -hmm. where it's like, hey, you guys stop operating yeah. uh, this week. Yeah. yeah. Just for the next couple of weeks. Don't It'll don't worry fine. about it. It's gonna yeah. be great. Uh no, there they actually there's like six companies and they control the capacity and they're like that ship's not sailing. That sh mm -hmm. you know what? Go get some scrubbers. Yeah. For IMO 2020. We're gonna, <laughs> the problem is, is that the That's people. That's coming too. Yeah, the people that uh, uh run the that install the scrubbers, mm -hmm. they're all sick, mm -hmm. or they're quarantined, mm -hmm. or they're stuck in their house. They can't go and and install these things. So, it's not like they can go and do something else. So these scrubbers that clean the diesel fumes that come out of the ships that uh, you know everybody is so you know the the new IMO. 
you need to have a cleaner burning diesel fuel, very low sulfur fuel for the maritime, which used to be just complete garbage fuel. It used yeah. to be the stuff that burned, and it was just straight pollution yeah. into, the, into the air. A lot of sulfur. Sulfur is very bad for us. goes up into the air. Water falls through it. It creates sulfuric acid. Yeah. Do you know what sulfuric acid does to your skin? What does that do to that skin? <laughs> I'm almost about to ask. What does that do? It doesn't. It's not great for your complexion. Because I, I thought I saw it was a L'Oreal commercial. Yeah. No, that was hydrolonic acid. Never mind. I, I, I yeah, get those I two mixed that. up all yeah. the time. <laughs> so sulfuric acid, of course, very caustic, uh, just as all acid is. Yeah. Caustic meaning that it basically breaks down whatever substance it falls on. Yeah. Uh, and it's very bad for us to breathe, to have hit us, et cetera. Obviously, this is a good reason that they're doing this. Mm -hmm. We want this to happen. Some economic impact down the stream may not be the worst thing, uh, you know, especially since you you know, you don't have a lot of protection up top. There. No. <laughs> Just going through life, you know, yeah. take it as it comes, you know. I mean, we need our macroeconomic brain intact, and if that's sulfuric acid, yeah. <laughs> it's going to just... If that a, penetrates, it's a, there's not a lot there. Is, the, these forecasts are going to start looking wonky. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Yeah. So the V recovery, again, super soft February, mm -hmm. basically dead. March, softer than expected. Mm -hmm. uh, not a big. A re and then all of a sudden in April and May, huge recovery. A ramp up by mid. Talk about a huge ramp up. You mm -hmm. have the, all your volumes kind of come online. And this is. You know, this is a very optimistic outlook, especially for the carriers and brokers out there that are looking for this level of volatility. This is a very volatile setup. Uh, it means that they have contained it in China. The world itself is doing okay in terms yeah. of managing it, et cetera. A lot of assumptions here. Uh, China is supposedly have it, you know, it's plateaued in terms of its outbreak. Mm -hmm. It doesn't appear to be growing at the rate that it was before. Um, so this potentially means that by May, June, all this stuff comes back online just in time for what happens in June. Produce? Yes, yes. That oh, is, that's a little bit earlier than it's June. It's a little earlier. A little but, earlier than June. But it can still occur in June yeah. and some of the impacts. But freight peak. So the summer peak of freight movements. We even have um, Christmas in July. Yes, right after Amazon June, Prime. So, yeah, those day. made up e-commerce yeah. holidays. But July is traditionally a soft month. What They get prepared for Amazon Prime in the months leading up to July. They have it all stocked in the warehouses. So that's why you see a lot of the freight happen in June yeah. and May. Mm -hmm. uh, you have this secondary retail peak in the summer. Yeah. Everybody's excited because it's warm and happy. I'm mm -hmm. happy. I'm always happy. Yeah. I'm always happy. I'm shopping at Target with my wife. <laughs> uh, you're at Walmart. Um, <laughs> having a good old time yeah. with the people. Yeah. The people having of good, Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> having a good time. And it's because we feel better. You know, construction is booming. You get a little bit more economic activity. Also, people are getting ready to go on vacation in July. It's always vacation in my the mind. second most vacation time of year outside the week between Christmas and New Year's. July? July is the most vacation month really? outside of the Christmas holiday. Okay. Um, so that's why you see this traditional lull. You know, the freight market peaks in June because everybody's like, oh, get out the door and ship that and yeah. you're going to take care of it all right i'm out yeah yeah you know uh so that creates a lot of volatility especially in the spot market you have increased freight volumes on average they're about five to ten percent higher mm -hmm. than those in january february yeah um anyway last year we were roughly six to seven percent higher in yeah. june whereas 2018 we were about 10 to 11 percent higher in june than we were in january of yeah. uh, 2018 yeah. And January 2018 was considered pretty strong. Right. Uh, so, again, undersupplied market at that point in time. So that's another whole supply demand. Yeah. Uh, discussion. Heard that, that once had. or twice. Yeah. You know what, Zach? What's that? It was around December 31st. I read this article that said there was going to be a slow start and a ramp up by mid-2020. Wow. Who wrote that? Anthony Smith. Who is this? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> this economist. Yeah. I put out slow start, strong finish. I mean... I don't know if this is the exact same ramp up that they're also anticipating, but it, it, it makes sense to me. I don't know if I'm as optimistic as that, that, that springing up by, what is it, uh, April. Mm -hmm. I think we'll start to see some recovery. I don't know if it's just going to be as robust as they're saying, mm -hmm. but that, that, I mean, a lot of people the trend think, makes now, sense. Now, a lot of people think, and I, I think this is an interesting topic to, to talk about, this, this whole concept of recovery or, you know, pent-up demand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I myself have a story 
about pent up demand. Yeah, it did not go the way that they they said it would. So we should I should probably share it. So there was a period of time back in my old life uh, that our system went down. Yeah, and we couldn't bill freight, mm-hmm. so we couldn't take orders. Mm-hmm. And this is like a death sentence for a carrier. Yeah, uh, and the idea here is that you simply lose that demand. Mm-hmm. It doesn't show up two days later when your system comes back online. Right. It shows up later when, no, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't show up later at yeah. all. You literally, it's almost like those days do not exist. Yeah. And so that's my concern for this, you know, this V-shaped recovery thing is great in theory. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the idea of it because obviously it creates some extra level of interest for me and yeah. intrigue and just to see how it plays out. Uh, but there's also the distinct possibility that that demand just, we just miss it. Yeah. So when, and what we mean by that is that, you know, Apple phone production, iPhone production, they, you know, somebody goes to click on the order and it's not going to be there for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Well, they just go find something else or they don't do it entirely. Mm-hmm. There's this phantom demand aspect of things that you just, sometimes you just miss. Because, mm-hmm. Again, we live in a society in America, for sure, where we have more than we need. <laughs> eh, yeah, we don't necessarily need as much as we order. So, mm-hmm. you know, because that thing isn't there, you know, I myself, if you think about it, you know, we always try to apply ourselves to the situation so we can understand it. I look on Amazon and I'm looking for shoes the other day mm. and I and I have a specific shoe in mind and I'm like, yeah, I need my ten and a half two red e, bottoms, you know, obviously is dope as can be <laughs> um super flashy guy uh and they don't have it yeah i just give up <laughs> you yeah. know uh on to the next thing because I don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't need it yeah you know and that's and that's my concern for this mm. is not necessarily that we won't need everything that's going on here but it at the same time that v-shaped thing i think will be a little bit more muted than simply like we're going to recover all the percentage points lost in march mm. and february mm-hmm. I think it'll be more. I think we'll certainly see a recovery to a point where it's like, oh, finally we have that thing, mm-hmm. and some of these things will get back ordered. But it's, I don't think it's going to be to the point where it's like we, lost, we were down 10% in February, we're up 10% in April. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, I, it almost hints towards our closing conversation for today. Oh. But I, I, I agree with you there that I don't think that it's going to be a rapid ramp up. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be a nice easing Mm -hmm. process that's going to flow into the end of the year. Um, But yeah, I'm 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 on board with that thing. And 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 the current and the current state of the market, like we aren't feeling it at all in America right now in terms of freight volumes and all that kind of stuff. And we'll we'll touch on that here in a bit. America. But first, today's topic. So for those of you that have been listening, we've been covering a variety of topics in the uh, in the freight world. Uh, Basically, a freight 101, if you will. Yeah. How stuff works for freight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you did a nice how stuff works for the economy. I did a macro, yeah. macro edition. Yeah. yeah. That was a little, you know. It was in Colorado. Skin. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> we both had fun. Yeah. I listened to 10 minutes of it and I was like, you know what? He doesn't need me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. This, this wouldn't be Freightonomics without you. Yeah. I think you did a pretty good job. It would just be a novice. I was, I was really entertained. But at the same time, the reason that I didn't listen to the whole show is because I was like, you know what? I'm on a vac- vacation. Mm. I'm on a vacation from freight. I mm-hmm. need to clear my mind. I need to get my zen straight. Mm-hmm. Rebalance. I need to get get back in touch with things that aren't freight because find out who is Zach. Yeah. That's mm. I do this all the time every day and I geek out over it and I love it, but I can't I need I understand that there's also there's that a healthy Zach, distance. There's a Zach that needs attention. Yeah. You know self care. That isn't involved in freight. Yeah. Or economics. <laughs> I like to think the same. Yeah. I like to think the same. So this week we are covering carrier costs, and how they drive trucking rates. So we're going to break down trucking rates a little bit here for the next little segment, and we're going to break down what makes those costs what they are, uh, what moves them up and down, uh, you know, how you can better, you know, I think with understanding of, you know, how these underlying, these basic costs operate, you know, even if you're a broker out there, you know, you, you, you get a, you call a carrier every day. Yeah. And you say, hey, I need you to cover this freight for me. You don't know what they're doing on their end to calculate that number. Mm -hmm. You think that they're doing sort of like what you're doing. Like, "Uh, I feel like maybe it's $2.15 a mile. How about $2,500? Yeah. (laughs) 
uh, a fun fact uh, for the brokers out there that are calling your carriers. So as I was getting called by you back in the day, I would actually make sure that my number was not even. Gotcha. Because I did. mind trick there? Yeah. I was like, I don't want you to think that I'm just making this up. Yeah. Because I wasn't making it up. But at the same time, I wanted to make it very, very apparent mm -hmm. that I wasn't making it, it up. put some thought into it. Because $2,500 feels like, well, you add, you, you add it up. You know, yeah. you just round it up to, to something and you're just throwing a number out there. And I was like, no, 2481, 63. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. Yeah. And I, and I actually developed a model that, you know, even if the model came out on the, not on the dot, yeah. like $2,400 or whatever it was, I would add 15 cents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just to make it seem like it wasn't that round and even because mm -hmm. I did not want them to think that I was just kind of saying like, nah, yeah, I can cover it for you for $1,600 today. Right. Um, anyway, there are reasons for that number, and I'm going to break them down for you. Zach, I am interested as to what drives carrier cost. Yeah. So we're going to break those down real quick. I'm going to tell you a kind of, I'm going to approach this from the truckload side. Okay. I'm not going to give you some LTL breakdown because that's far more complex. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the principles are simple. Right. I mean, every LTL operator still has a truckload cost involved. Uh, it's still a number derived from operational activity. Still, it's, it's all the same thing, just broken down a little bit differently, a little bit more complex. Uh, maybe that LTL pricing model breakdown is for another day. Uh, but this one is specifically going to be focused on your truckload operating costs and also the additional costs that go into influencing that number, such as market costs and also network design. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to get super in depth because I don't want everybody to just be like, "Whoa, that's too much." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep it pretty high level. Yeah, uh, it's a slow ramp up. This, so, what this do you series. think? What do you think, Anthony? I'm going to ask you. Yeah. Because you're an economist, mm. you haven't you haven't sat in the pricing department of a freight company. I've walked through. What do you think? Uh, you know, one of just name the. What do you think the biggest single operational cost, not market driven, mm. is? When you are calculating a, tr you know, I need a truck that moves from Atlanta to Dallas today, what's that big number on there? And it could be 5% of the overall cost. It could be 25%, et cetera. I'm, so you're going to need someone to drive it. So I'm thinking a driver and. Nope, you get one. Uh, okay. Got to pick one. All right, because I'm between driver and then the, the truck itself. You're not wrong. Okay. I'm You're not go wrong. With driver. You're not wrong on either count because it depends. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So the driver cost uh, is up there. Uh, on average, it runs the number one or number two cost. Okay. Uh, the secondary cost, of course, is the truck cost. Okay. Uh, which can also be the number one cost, depending on the length of haul. So is, <laughs> I'm interested. Tires. That's up there, too. Okay. That's, uh, that's not as big of a cost. I kind of lump that for the point of this discussion into like that maintenance category, but okay. yes, most trucking companies do consider, they will have a separate line item on their income statement mm -hmm. for tire expense. They do not lump it in with maintenance expense because okay. tires are such a heavy burden of expense. It's also treated independently, uh, for the sheer fact that you know, you have all this kind of preventative maintenance, et cetera, that's lumped in with usage, wear and tear over time. You replace tires. They're brand new. You don't replace an engine <laughs> that yeah. often. You don't replace, you know, you replace these little mechanical pieces. But once those tires are new, they're new. Right. You don't have to worry about the truck on top of it. It's, it's brand new. Yeah. So it is, it is treated a little bit independently uh, throughout the industry. But tires on average run about three to four cents a mile. Okay. Uh, on average. And again, I'm breaking it down by per mile uh, because it is more, it's more like a variable cost versus a fixed cost. Gotcha. So you have variable and fixed costs in your model. I'm just going to run down the list here of what uh, from top to bottom in kind of this fixed to variable cost setup. Okay. Uh, so you have your truck and trailer costs. Yeah. Some people lease, some people buy, most of them finance it to an extent. They don't just go out and spend 250 k yeah. on a truck willy-nilly. Yeah. Or if you're, in a, you know, if you're on the used truck market, we're running around 58 k yeah. uh, for a three-year-old model right now. Um, but that depreciates. That's a depreciable asset. I'm not going to break that down. Yeah. That's a different show. 
Uh, <laughs> but it costs anywhere from about $1,300 to $1,700 a month. Okay. Um, and then, your, of course, your trailer, anywhere, depending, again, if you've bought some, like, holy piece of garbage, or maybe you're just hauling, you know, whoever your customer's trailer is, which does happen from time to time, uh, that's free. Yeah. But typically, people will have their own trailer pools, et cetera, especially the larger carriers. And that costs anywhere from about 100 to $400 a month. Gotcha. Uh, on average, uh, dry van carrier. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more to the dry van side here. Largest, There's obviously course, yeah. just add some points yeah. to, the, uh, to the reefer side. We broke down the, you know, the various trailer types last or two weeks ago with Donnie Gilbert, three yeah. weeks ago now with Donnie Gilbert. Um, so you have licensing mm-hmm. and your taxes. Yeah. So government influence, that's not a huge cost. It's it's literally like a maybe a hundred bucks a month yeah. total uh, for any individual uh, unit. Then you have insurance costs, which are nine to you know. Well, actually, they have a pretty wide range of variability. I'm going to say nine to eleven cents a mile in general, especially if you have you know because the insurance costs are based on your utilization of your truck. Yeah, and as a whole, that's something that's ramping up a little bit more right there yes. the industry yeah yeah we broke down insurance costs on an episode in the in the past and how they are expanding rapidly you can yeah. always check that out uh to see what we think about that and what's going on there uh then you have your wages which is your driver wages and benefits right now we're averaging as an industry about 58 59 cents a mile for a driver cost at another 22 percent for bennies Okay. Uh, again depends on the company there's variability here yeah not ever there's no one silver bullet <laughs> for a number I can throw at you. Uh, maintenance tires. Uh, this, you know, for a brand new truck, you're talking maintenance costs of about three to four cents a mile. Older units, five to seven years old, they can run as high as 20 to 25 cents a mile uh, because you're just constantly having to maintain that unit. Yeah. So big range there. On average, you're talking about 10 to 15 cents uh, per mile of maintenance cost. Uh, then you have the fuel. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Oh, boy. So the fuel costs, you know, in the truckload space, yeah, it's based on a per mile charge in terms of fuel surcharge. It's yeah. like, you know, you get a truck truckload rate at $2 a mile, then they tell you it's going to be a 30 cent per mile fuel surcharge on top of that. Or maybe they just throw it all in the number. Gotcha. A lot of people go all in, especially when dealing with uh, just one-time spot market loads, et cetera. Uh, but most contracted freight has an existing rate per mile and then a fuel surcharge number that fluctuates with the fuel surcharge up and down of course because fuel is volatile yeah it's a volatile commodity and truckload carriers simply don't have the time to sit there and manage it every day and they have some, they need to have some way to offset that volatility mm-hmm. most of them do not pass along the entire cost of the fuel to the customer okay. in my mind as a pricing guy is fallacy uh, because I think people in general are more um, they're okay with paying for that as like, they understand that there's volatility in fuel costs, et cetera. I would rather know it yeah. transparently, but so right now, if we were do a little exercise, mm. $3 per gallon on average, we're below that right now. I think we're around $2 and 68 cents mm-hmm. per gallon, uh, average United States DOE rate. So if we were to assume a $3 per gallon and your truck runs about six and a half miles per gallon, mm-hmm. Typically, that's, you know, it's anywhere from six to seven miles per gallon. We ran about 6.7 miles per gallon on average back in the day. But um, so I'm given a little bit of leeway. Yeah. So what that translates to is about a 46 cent per mile fuel cost. 46 per mile? 46 cents. Okay. Can you guess what a $3 per mile average F fuel surcharge rate would be? So that's additional, right? So this is going to be... The on number that, of... that carriers pass along. They're not passing along the full cost. Okay. They're passing along. They're trying to, they're just, the point of the fuel surcharge for a truckload carrier is to offset their uh, fuel cost volatility. Mm-hmm. A lot of that fuel cost is already baked into the base rate, as okay. they call it. Uh, so that $2 per mile you're paying, yeah. part of that's fuel. So to be like somewhere closer to like, I don't know, 50 cents or so, 55 cents? 30 31 32 cents per mile okay is what they'll pass along okay. on average everybody has their own fuel surcharge tables but on average you're talking about 31 32 cents per mile when it's around three dollars per gallon gotcha um and so you can see that there's 
about a 15, 16 cent per mile difference mm -hmm. on the cost, which is baked into the base rate. Zach, you're throwing a lot of numbers out here. Yep. I'm hearing 22%, 10%, 8%. Mm -hmm. This is all operating. All operating. So when we're adding all this up, all the operating stuff, mm -hmm. what's a typical operating ratio for a carrier? Is it unheard of to hear it around the 90% mark? That would be a great a operating great. ratio. You hear that? That's a great. great operating ratio. What an industry. These night, <laughs> so your night swifts yeah. and things like that that operate in the 80s? Yeah. That's not, that's not that's, the that's, standard. They're, they're out there above and beyond. Yeah. And then when you hear the rail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the 56. To they're pulling it in. It's a 60 OR range. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Software companies don't make that kind of OR. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so operating ratio, of course, is the ratio between operating costs yeah. and operating revenue. Right. So anything that it costs you to run that truck does not include interest and taxes and debt servicing, things like that. Simply, you're paying a driver, you have admin, all this kind of stuff for your day-to-day -day business. It is lumped into that operating revenue or that operating expense. Then you have operating revenue, yeah. which is what the customer's paying you for. So they get a load for $2,000. Uh, it costs you $1,700. To run that truck, yeah, you get three hundred dollars profit for running it, but you also have to pay debt, taxes, etc. Mm -hmm. After that, so you're not necessarily making the full three hundred dollars at the end of the day. Yeah, but operating ratio is there to measure your effectiveness as an operator because that other stuff is just business, like outside business decisions that you're trying to measure how effective your operation is. Yeah, and all of these costs that I just listed are there to help you you know, basically measure or they're there, they're, they're the costs that don't exist if you don't run a truck. Right. Um, you, you don't need to pay for a truck if you're not moving it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but another aspect of this, that's not necessarily, you know, super transparent is the overhead costs. Okay. So U S express mm. operates down the road here. I worked for them for a period of time. Um, they have facilities across the country. Right. They don't get those for free. They have to lump that cost into the cost of operating the truck because without those trucks, they don't need those facilities. Right. Um, Their maintenance facilities largely. Uh, some, you know, drivers take rest there, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, they are also trailer pool facilities where they can park the trailers overnight. Security watches it and all that kind of stuff. So, but there's also a lot of other people there. In people those, in offices? In those offices that cost money. Yeah. People like me. Yeah. Who didn't necessarily drive a truck, right? And, but were but needed for the operation. It, I, I want to think that. Yeah, I want to think, <laughs> I want to think so. I want to think that I was I was useful in that regard. Uh, yeah. But you know, you have your dispatchers, uh, you know, your maintenance, your fuel desk, your people, you know, your administrators, things like that that are helping make sure that you are effectively managing your business as effectively as possible. That is also there, and that op, that overhead number can range anywhere from. 2% to yeah. your smallest, like small of small carriers where you have a, a guy and a desk <laughs> yeah. telling his two trucks what to do, uh, to over 40% Wow! in the LTL world. Wow. And I mean, and, and things are a little bit different, right? So drivers, a lot of times they'll switch companies, they'll switch carriers left and right, you know, yep. just take off one hat, put on another. Yep. And I remember when we were talking about, um, one of the many closures last year, uh, like earlier this year, what, Celadon? Yep. Um, you know, how many of those drivers are going to be able to just kind of, all right, switch, I'm all off to Dart or something like that. You know, I... They just hop into another truck. Yeah, just hop into another truck. This is Actually, life they now. probably kept that truck. Because <laughs> <laughs> somebody probably bought it and they were like, you know what, just keep driving it. And yeah. Do the same thing. Good to go. For us now. Yeah. <laughs> not the same story for the office, the admin folk. No. Not, not as easy, right? No, not as yeah. easy. You don't have as high of an uh, attrition rate in the, uh, in the admin side or the office side. Um, but... Again, that driver pool is a little different world. Yeah, whole different. Right? You want to yeah. be on the road all the time, every time? Yeah. No. Um, but again, out. so those are just the base operational costs. Now, there is another layer of added stuff. So when you're getting a trucking rate, $2 a mile, I just added up about, you know, 
roughly a dollar nine cents per mile on average of operational cost. Add a little bit of overhead in there. You've got about, you know, depending on your operation, let's just call it a dollar twenty for fun. Yeah. But most trucking rates don't operate around a dollar twenty. Mm. You know, we've looked at, you know, some of our rates that we have in sonar. Uh, you know, you look at uh, you know, LA to Dallas. I think it runs around a dollar forty per mile right now or okay. so. Dollar fifty, maybe. I might be wrong actually. I might be thinking of something <laughs> else. That feels a little low. Um but what what else is going on in that number? So a lot of what happens is, you know, especially in markets or lanes such as like a Los Angeles to Seattle or Seattle to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Totally, it's it's the same amount of miles, technically the same amount of operational cost. Yeah. To run, it's the same mileage, same hours, et cetera, assuming the same traffic conditions, whatnot, on any given day, because it's the exact same interstate up and down I five. Yeah. But why is the rate so discrepant? Stuff. <laughs> stuff going in those trailers. Well, yes, sort of. And stuff to come back with. Exactly. Mm. That's right. The stuff in there. There is a high chance that you will not have an immediate pickup of waiting on you when yeah. you go to Seattle. Yeah. And Or if you do find something, you're going to have to drive a good distance. Yeah. So that's why that rate gets high going into Seattle. You got to make it worth your while. Because you do. You have to make it worth your while. Am I going to find something to haul out of there, right? Yeah. No, you definitely need something to haul out of there. Uh, and that's that's the challenge. And I'm going to look it up, actually. I'm just going to pull up with our handy-dandy sonar. Sonar. Yeah. So Los Angeles. The benchmark. Yeah. Analyzing, yeah. <laughs> monitoring, and forecasting tool for the freight industry. Right. And I'm going to see just exactly what our rate and our Wi-Fi is not great in this booth because we're in an armored booth. <laughs> Uh, We're protected from Corona. A dollar ninety per mile from Los Angeles to Seattle. Okay. What do you think the rate is going from Seattle to Los Angeles? Mm. From Seattle to Los Angeles, I would think. Even mind, this is the same exact mileage. Is it higher? Much higher? Much lower? Much lower? Way well, down. Dollar thirty. Eighty-eight cents. Oh, wow. Eighty-eight cents per mile. Wow. Do you know why it can be so low? Why is that? So I, I just told you, if you listen to me, what I said before, mm -hmm. the operating costs around a dollar twenty per mile on average. Mm -hmm. Yet carriers are charging eighty eight cents per mile right now mm -hmm. on the spot market to get out of Seattle to go back to Los Angeles. Yeah, where all the stuff is. Why can they do that? Why? Because they charged way more for it coming in. Yeah, it's a dollar ninety cents per mile going in. Yeah. That is, that is another factor in these rates. It's the amount of effort they're going to have to put into utilizing their truck. And if they don't have a good opportunity coming back out, uh, they got to charge for it because if they don't charge for it, they won't be in business. Yeah. <laughs> 88 yeah. cents per mile is about a 120 to 130 OR. Uh, whereas the dollar ninety is roughly a sixty to seventy OR. Oh, we got a jo Joseph Delusi. I think oh. I said that right. Accounting for dead return miles. Yeah, there you go. There. Good yeah. job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. As again, watching these uh, LinkedIn comments and YouTube comments. So, if any so, comments, questions, let them know. Yeah, come on in with that. I love it when I hear the uh, the pricing guys for sure. Yeah, they're my people. Um, <laughs> You so, might like this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Director of Logistics at Target. Oh, good. For, yes. <laughs> See, I made a friend. There you go. There you <laughs> we can go. talk. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, in your, I'm in your camp. <laughs> Not Anthony, though. Don't I'm worry there. about him. I'm there for <laughs> um, So, yeah. So, the carriers have to charge for a certain amount of, uh, you know, deadhead miles or percentage that they don't utilize that truck. Yeah. Because they lose money on that truck if it doesn't get used. So utilization, deadhead percentage is part of that calculation. If you're going into a market where there is less freight coming out than going in, yeah, you're you need to charge for the potential of how much percent of those miles coming back out are you going to need empty. to travel yeah. to make up for the you know the cost of that trip. Yeah, uh, and of course, being in the ultra competitive market that we are in, mm -hmm. sometimes people are just like, "Get me out of here! Mm -hmm. I don't care if I lose all the money." Yeah. I need to get out of here so I can literally stop losing. Yeah. It's like when you're at the Vegas and you're spinning that roulette wheel and you're down. <laughs> you, 
you at some point you're like, you know what? I'm gonna walk away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just yeah, cut my losses. I'm gonna lose everything, but I'm at least not gonna go bankrupt. Yeah, <laughs> and that's exactly what that's a pitfall of carriers. Uh, you know, especially in pricing across the country, they do not get to uh, you know necessarily pick and choose where they get their freight. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, so on that note, there is this whole. This is the complicated part of pricing. This next part that all the things that we've covered so far, that's the easy stuff. Pretty black and white. Yeah, pretty black and white. Uh, the next part is figuring out what exactly can I charge for this freight? Mm. Who's out? Who? What? What are the options that Target, that Joseph out there, yeah, uh, you know, is is seeing that he can go grab if he calls CR England tomorrow for this for their five loads? Are they going to say yes or no? Yeah. And of course, that's a lot of what we cover at uh, Freightways. We have the uh, the OTRI, the Tender Rejection Index. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more often a carrier rejects something from Target, that means that they've got either something else going on that's occupying their trucks mm-hmm. somewhere else, and it's disrupting their flow of their network that much. Yeah, they can't go cover it. Yeah. Or there's a bunch of lettuce that's popping out of California right now, and it's Produce paying either. eight thousand yeah. dollars a load for something that Target's only paying twenty five hundred dollars a load mm-hmm. for. And this happened to us at my LTL company uh, numerous times Mm -hmm. where it's like, ah, I just don't have a truck. Well, the reason you don't have a truck is because you're covering that high paying, high dollar freight somewhere else. And you know what? It's fair because I'm not guaranteeing you freight every day. You're not guaranteeing me capacity every day. But if you do have it, we know exactly where we're going to be, you know, in terms of in terms of rate. So. You know, I, I think most of the shippers out there understand this concept at this point. Uh, it's kind of a game. You know, you're not going to guarantee 4,000 loads a year, uh, like you say on the bids. Mm-hmm. Carriers aren't going to guarantee 4,000 trucks a year either to be in that one spot every single day because they it's, it's simply too hard to do that. Just like yeah. you can't tell that the coronavirus is going to show up and wreck your entire freight spend and freight demand right. for the month of March. Yeah, I, There's nothing you can do about that. The China shut down, out of your control. We get it, you right, know. Right. But at the same time, hurricane hits Houston, destroys the entire city. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of infrastructure we got to repair. Yeah. Getting good money for it, but also more demand is down there in general, mm-hmm. disrupting the balance of the freight network. Now, I don't want to over. I don't want to glaze over. We don't have a lot of time left, but I don't want to glaze over the fact that freight network. What does that mean when I when you hear that? Freight network. What do you think a trucking operator thinks when they hear freight network? So when I hear freight network, I think of different locations strategically placed throughout the country of hubs and distribution centers placed in order to keep operations running efficiently. So that's true. And that's more shipper oriented. Mm. Uh, But it's also, I think you listen to my LTL talk. (laughs) I, I think I was here for that. You did. You did. <laughs> uh, so hubs uh, are typically used in LTL networks, but also yeah. in, in, you know, when you're talking about truckload movements and stuff, they don't necessarily have hubs, but mm. there are hubs for freight and for distribution networks for shippers. Yeah. Uh, Target has DCs set up strategically across the country. Uh, certain of those DCs will supply certain volumes of certain retail items, et cetera. Uh, and they will distribute them throughout a region. Yeah. Well, it's up to the carriers to figure out, okay, so they, you know, they haul for Target. They know that they can count on Target shipments in March, April to be at a certain level going into certain lanes. Yeah. So say they're shipping heavy from Los Angeles to uh, Denver in the month of February because they're trying to fill up that DC, that warehouse, because there's high seasonal demand for ski stuff, et cetera. They push that in there. Well, they need to figure out the opposing load that gets them out of Denver and gets them to wherever it needs to be. Yeah. But they also need to make sure that they have enough trucks sitting in Los Angeles to service Target's needs. So there's a give and take there. So maybe their network looks very heavy going from Los Angeles to Dallas or Los Angeles to Denver to Dallas back to L.A. Mm -hmm. And they have a triangle of operation, et cetera. Well, that's a very that's a little bit easier to manage uh, when you're in a region. Yeah. Because you have these little. Obviously, the population centers are where the freight ends up eventually. Uh, a lot of these shippers will be positioned throughout these rural areas, 
and getting that truck back into those rural areas is a bit of a challenge. Yeah. You know, not everything is sitting in Ontario, California, Fontana, or whatever it is. You know, Atlanta, Georgia. There's a lot of it's there, but it doesn't necessarily all end up there. So balancing your network, and this is where you come in, Anthony Smith. Mm. A lot of these carriers will haul for a couple of shippers. Yeah. And they'll be very heavy one direction. Shippers, that's what they do. They're very one directional. They have a hub and yeah. then they distribute it out into the country. Right. It looks like my hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. They're very one directional by nature. Yeah. So you need to find the opposing shipper. Mm. Not just opposing shipper in terms of geography, but opposing shipper in terms of time. Gotcha. So you need to have the right amount of freight coming back at the right time mm-hmm. <laughs> for that shipper. So target busy shipping time of year, May, June, mm-hmm. pushing freight, Los Angeles, Denver. All of a sudden, they don't have as much freight anymore in July, but you have a huge shipper coming out of Denver in July and August. Yeah. That doesn't do you that much good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the right time. No, it's wrong. So you're out of balance. So Anthony Smith. Yeah. What parts of the country are heavy in economic activity. Well, a lot of these metropolitan and, areas. Um, so you're a housing... Housing guy. Yeah. Guy. Uh, yeah, housing construction. And housing's been doing quite well. Yes, yes. Housing's been doing very well. Um, and manufacturing, not so much, but we're seeing some some areas of optimism. <laughs> I'm not going to say it too loud. Um, but yeah, housing's doing well. Um, we even got new... Home sales numbers this morning at 10 a.m. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. I was excited. How are those? Uh, well, Zach, they hit a 12 and a half year high. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah. So new home sales are going up there. Wow. Um, yeah. But housing, you can look at the tree. So we just had a huge 13 year high yeah, in starts. housing starts. Yeah. Um, that was last month. And we're still up there. It was only like a 3.6, I think, percent decline month to month. Where do most... Top. So where do most building supplies, housing supplies come out of in the country, would you say? You got lumber. Yeah. Which yeah. is obviously the biggest one. Yeah. And then you've got, what, PVC pipes? <laughs> yeah, you got, you got lumber, you have your concrete, you mm-hmm. have um, your, your building material. So even like building products like roofing, things like that, siding. Um, vinyl siding is a little bit more popular, of course, in, in the New England area than it is in the South. But mm-hmm. like bricks more... Uh, Popular in the south region, southeast region, southwest might have a little bit more of those stucco, low looks. So it all depends on the regional preferences. A lot of that's also weather based too, right? Um, because you need certain building products for certain weather. But um, the most activity going on, a lot over half the building is going to be going on in the south region. Wow, um, is that because of the space? A lot of the space, yeah. cost of living as well, less mature market, especially compared to new. N- New England, Northeast area, right. very dense, a lot more, uh, a lot more multifamily homes being built there. Right. West also very dense and expensive. Why would you live in California? Um, <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Marianne, yeah. but um, great place to visit. But <laughs> just an expensive place. She um, did visit. She did visit exactly. Saw my that point. ocean. She proved my point. Um, you visited. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> but but when we're looking at the different regions, they're going to have different characteristics. But the South is definitely by far going to be the, the biggest driver. So um, if I'm a flatbed this. operator, I need to operate in the South. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, I guess my question is, so I'm a flatbed operator. I, got pick, I pick up my lumber from the Port of Mobile, New Orleans, mm-hmm. and then I drive to Atlanta to mm-hmm. go build my McMansion. Yeah, of course. What do okay. I do then? You need, need to get out of there. <laughs> you need to get out of there. How do I get out? You need to get out of there. You're going to find a, another area of you need to haul something. So what you can the other area that, that occupies flatbed is manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you're not hauling building product, building materials throughout the country and you're a flatbed operator, the next closest thing you can look for is where some of those hot markets are within manufacturing and industrial production. Industrial production, the latest numbers show that fabricated metals are doing well. I think that's going to lean into more infrastructure spending and multifamily um, homes, things like that, apartment buildings. Um, But we have regional Fed surveys. And so regional Fed surveys is kind of similar to the ISM where you get into building or business activity. Um, So we have the Empire State Manufacturing Index. We have the Philadelphia 
Fed index. We also have the Dallas Fed index. And so these are essentially surveys that are similar to the ISM that uh, show and, and really go into what manufacturing firms within the region are reporting business activity at. Are they, They're saying that the activity grow at a faster pace than recent months. They have all types of variables, different components like the ISM, like uh, new orders, employment, inventories, things like that. And so what we've seen in the Empire States, the Fed, um, I'm sorry, the Philadelphia Fed and the Dallas uh, survey was that they all showed increases um, for current business conditions. And so despite um, any kind of trade, tariff uncertainties, the most recent Corona <laughs> thing. Um, I'm bringing that Corona. <laughs> they're, they're, still, they're still seeing some increased activity. So okay. they, these are the numbers from the executives themselves. I know usually they, they spread it out through a diverse um, area of manufacturers. Not one industry is over-representing any of them. So as a whole, we're seeing um, more manufacturing activity propping up well, that's good. in some of these regional areas. Um, yeah. It's going to be some time before I think we see it actually impact national Mm -hmm. uh, levels where we see like industrial production just starting to ramp up. Um, right. But it's, it's encouraging to you see think, this. So do you think that the, you know, the Chinese situation with coronavirus might actually inspire some of this growth in short term or long term or any of it? Or Well, I, I think this is definitely an opportunity for some. So yeah. um, one of the things you mentioned when um, operations shut down, you find alternatives. And so when China is down, you find alternatives. And so this is a, a an opportunity for places like uh, locations in Southeast Asia, things like that, but also domestic, you know, to fill in, even though it might be a little bit more pricey, but this is an opportunity for, for some potential domestic solutions, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, just because maybe you're, you've been prepping because you had to find a solution after the the tear force earlier on in, in 2019 and you've been looking for alternatives to china or some different types of solutions so i think this is definitely an opportunity for um local manufacturers i think to kind of step in and say hey you know <laughs> america made you know yeah. and, um so i do this yeah so i think that's going to be it's going to be pricey of course in comparison but um i think definitely an opportunity there okay so on that note, and we're running up on time. So, you know, obviously the big story, we covered coronavirus. Uh, we talked about your freight costs yeah. and where they originate. We didn't dive deeply into the market influences, which I want to say for another day. Yeah. Uh, but again, I kind of glazed over. I said, you know, you run around $1.20 a mile. You know, again, I don't like dividing everything out per mile. Uh, it's, it's kind of like this. It, it dilutes the figure, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you will. But it is a thing because of the variable cost. It makes it easier to translate because you don't necessarily accrue maintenance expenses with the truck sitting. Yeah. So that being said, again, per mile on the fuel as well, you don't, you don't pay for fuel that you don't use. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it just helps. But at the same time, it hurts some of the allocations of your bigger numbers in terms of truck lease, et cetera, how you allocate that. You know, you have $1,700 per month. Do you divide that out for the total month? even though you're not driving every single day to yeah. divide it out per, you know, et cetera. I, I could go on for hours on that because I had that own debate in my mind. Yeah. But same time, on top of those operational costs, you have market influences, supply demand stuff, which we will dive into another day. But obviously a lot of what people are interested in is that market. What, what, what is influencing that market rate? Yeah. You know, other than the fact that a hurricane hit the, you know, Houston and ravaged it or produce is popping out of California. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are two very big examples of what does influence that market rate. Uh, but how that is measured and how people navigate that is another story. You know, Mike Vincent has his own little show. Shout out to Mike Vincent, just like we did earlier that in the show. forecasting show? Yep, freight forecasting. I was on it. I think you were on it a I few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Donnie Gilbert was on it one week, and I was on it one week. Good, so. It's an insightful show. It's pretty darn good. Yeah. And it talks, you know, it's not simply like telling you, hey, you should forecast freight prices no yeah, that's yeah. not it at all you gotta um, consider a lot of variables a lot of variables involved it's not just simply measuring well the spot rate for you know the 15 people shipping out of la yesterday 
we're going to project that forward. No, yeah. it's not. It's not that. So, uh, but again, to pull it back full circle, the impact of coronavirus is obviously the hot topic. Yes. Of, of the week, day, month, year, whatever you want to call it. So far, yeah. So year. far, yeah. we don't want to overblow it. We don't want to overhype it. But at the same time, we want to try to figure out what's true mm-hmm. and what's not. Mm-hmm. Um, 80,000 people infected. Yeah. Probably low. <laughs> 2,000 people died. Probably low. Mm-hmm. China not transparent. Right. Uh, 50% capacity, 50 to 60% capacity in the factories right now. What do you think is does this mean moving forward? You talked about the V-shape recovery theory. Mm-hmm. You know, that means robust, huge numbers in the summer, big second half of the year. Yeah. Or are we talking about mm, actually down overall in the market because the factories don't get up very fast and then we just miss out on all this demand? What do you yeah. think? So I think, um, I think there will be some pent-up demand. I don't think it will be as a phantom demand. I think there will be um, a rise as factories start to ramp up. And I think that increase in activity is really going to start ramping up by mid-2020. And I think we'll also start to see more uh, business investments around that time. Um, that was my thoughts back in December, that non-defense capital goods will start to start coming back online. And then we'll start seeing more and more growth from industrial production. So. I anticipate and I, I, I do think that uh, with Corona kind of going through its cycle, phasing through, I think we'll start to see some of that pent up demand, some of those orders that may have been on backlog or in hold kind of come to fruition and come online. Okay. Okay. That's fair. So I do think the coronavirus is a little bit overblown mm-hmm. in terms of overall impact, but I do think that the Chinese government is shutting down a lot of things. The factories are shutting down a lot of stuff mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, the theory is is that they manufactured it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so they do have an interest in making sure that they don't wreck the entire world economy. Right, right. Because <laughs> that does impact them. Uh, so that is real. Yeah. You know, they aren't getting back up to speed as fast. Do I think that it is some sort of life-threatening disease that's going to wreck the world's population like we saw in 1916, 17 with the flu pandemic? Mm-hmm. No, Mm -hmm. it is the flu, Mm -hmm. just a flu that we haven't seen. And it's literally like the entire country taking a sick day in China. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you just have a lot of the population that's down. It does impact production over there. We do rely on them a lot for production. Yeah. We will definitely see that in March Mm -hmm. uh, and, and probably throughout the year. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be simply as simple as saying like, well, March is down, you know, February, March are down. And then all of a sudden, boom, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be that clean. Uh, I, I think we will probably see a little bit extended period of time, softness, yeah. if you will. But again, only a third of the freight that we move in this country, according to uh, you know some estimates, comes from China. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that freight moves in August and September. Mm-hmm. And by that point in time, I'm pretty sure we're going to be back to 100% capacity. Uh, and I do think, kind of like what you said, the stuff that we missed earlier this year, a lot of these retailers are going to be like, we need to make up for that stuff because mm-hmm. we're going to, maybe they'll have a softer summer. I think we will see a little bit of a softer spring mm-hmm. than we anticipated, uh, a little bit of softer summer than we anticipated in terms of overall uh, purchases yeah. on the retail side, construction side. I, I don't know if that's going to be impacted. Um, I feel like that's still okay yeah. because people are all, they're going to, we have wood here. <laughs> yeah, construction is doing well. Yeah, I think it's continuing. We, we have wood here. But the retail side is really what we're talking about when we're talking about China. Mm-hmm. Plastic stuff, toys, uh, you know, a lot of prefab stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, the electronics, the phones, the TVs, et cetera, that's a, that's a third and fourth quarter thing. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of these companies will have a softer first and second quarter, and then all of a sudden third and fourth quarter, here we go. Yeah, They're going to be like, we need to make sure that we have everything humanly possible here. China's going to be like, we need to make sure we're cranking out as much as possible. You guys are well, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I do think that I, I think it will be, it won't be a V, it'll be a U. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it'll be, uh, you know, a soft, a lowercase U. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That we'll see uh, here later in the year. Yeah, I think I think that that, that makes sense. Um, I think more so on I think there'll be more of a ramp up on the industrial side mm-hmm. for it's like machinery that maybe there's not an alternative to. Right. China is my go to. I have operations. I need this Cheap. capital good set up. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's going to be the thing that kind of sparks the flame for uh, manufacturing mm-hmm. coming up in the second 
half of the year. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm going to be watching closely. But yeah, the, the the whole retail stuff, that's that, that's going to be more of a second half of 2020 thing. China will be well by then. I think we'll be good. I need to hope so. Yeah. And if not, they're going to pretend that they are. They will. <laughs> They'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, that wasn't much of a debate. So next week, maybe we talk, uh, about, yeah. maybe we talk about food. You don't need it. We need yeah. capsules already. Uh, Eating is starting to become a waste of time, Zach. Companies can be so much more productive if they just had like little capsules, you know? Oh, that's all we need. Boop. That's that'll pass just HR. Get back. <laughs> that'll pass HR. Right there. It's Everybody waste of oh, time. Have your capsule. You know yeah. what? You can go to China. Yeah. <laughs> you Efficiency. Can go to China. That sounds exactly like what they do over there. Efficiency. <laughs> That's exactly what they do. All right. Well Are we gonna close out with the with the coffee down music? We're gonna close out with whatever it is on this button right here. All right. <laughs> That's awful. You can't close with that. That didn't sound like. You can't close with what? that. Shout out to Emila. Yeah. I got friends. There it is. Emila. There it is. I got friends <laughs> running the show. I got there it is. They have clarity in their song. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. Why is it so hype? And I'm ready for some more. Yeah.